the church in America is going to suffer so terribly. And we laugh now, but they will come after us. They will come after our children. They will close the net around us while we are playing soccer mom and soccer dad. While we are arguing over so many little things and mesmerized by so many trinkets. The net even now is closing around you and your children and your grandchildren. And it does not cause you to fear. You will be isolated from society as has already happened. Anyone who tries to run for office who actually believes the Bible will be considered a lunatic until finally we are silenced. We will be called things that we're not and persecuted not for being followers of Christ but for being radical fundamentalists who do not know the true way of Christ which of course is love and tolerance. You'll go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. They've already come after your children, and for most of you, they got them. You got them through the public schools and indoctrination and the university and indoctrination, and then you wonder why your children come out not serving the Lord. It's because you fed them right into the devil's mouth. BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at bcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you, Mr. Morris, and welcome to Crosstalk. It is our privilege to have you join us today in our topic Oh, I tell you, we've got one here for you. It is uh, dealing with the subject of indoctrination. In fact, it's, well, our theme today is not just the words indoctrination, but it's the name of a very, very good book that's on the market and one I think that you need to regard very highly if you have kids in uh, school or even parents or grandparents to have it to bring some good influence into the family framework. I remember many years back, uh, when uh, Samuel Blumenfeld was my guest here in the studios, a man who is very skilled on uh, the truth of real education. He had a book dealing with the Trojan horse uh, of education where indoctrination was occurring. And many of us wonder why it is that we have, we have strange and bizarre things happening with young people who uh, supposedly are being raised in schools where good stuff is being taught. But the Trojan horse that's invading our educational system is our topic today. Our guest is Colin Gunn. He's an award-winning writer, director, and producer, and accomplished animator. He is the homeschool father of seven who produced a documentary field trip of a lifetime. Colin and his family travel across America in an old yellow school bus exploring the origins and social impact of public school education. And, of course, our topic today, indoctrination. We say welcome, Colin. Nice to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, Colin, I, uh, I am very impressed with your book, and I'm also impressed with the, the people who are contributors to it. And I'm going to just kind of read the list here. R.C. Sproul, Jr., who is no stranger to our audience, and my good friend Ken Ham, uh, Doug Phillips, uh, Vody uh, Bachman, uh, e. Ray Moore, you have uh, Kevin Swanson, Israel Wayne, uh, John Taylor Gatto, uh, Samuel Blumenfeld, and Erwin Lutzer, the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. So you've got a pile of information in this book. But oh, yes, absolutely. We, we went and found some of the best people in America that are speaking out on this subject. So, you know, we believe when we make a book or a movie, we, we have a movie that, that goes along with the book, that we find the the witnesses, the expert witnesses that can testify it. So it's not just my opinion. The people that speak in this book, they they really are worth listening to. And our guest today, Colin, has a little interesting accent, and uh, I asked him where it was from. He says it's from Scotland. And so if you hear that and you wonder where it's from, that's what this story is. Well, Colin, uh, first of all, you're the father of seven homeschool kids, uh, tell us a little about your family and uh, and how you got into this whole school homeschool business. Oh, I'd be happy to. I actually have eight children now. We have an, another one um, that came along since mm. we made the, made the movie and had the book 
out. So we're, we're so thankful for that. We have a, a large family here in Waco, Texas, and uh, I came. I had the blessing of meeting a, a, a Baylor girl in New York City and uh, decided that uh, my life would be best set uh, in America, and so I moved over in 99. And so I, I've been here since, and, and, and now I'm an American citizen. So I, I have, a, a, I think, a, a privilege of being an American, but also uh, being a bit of an outsider, an immigrant, someone who can look at the culture in America and make some analysis of it. And so when we came over, one of the most striking things that I saw was the big yellow bus. And so it was clear to me, if we were going to discuss the issue of education, that the big yellow bus would be the symbol that we would use in the film, and it's also represented there on the book cover, because it's such a symbol of, of uh, the educational structure that we have. We have somewhat of a totalitarian uh, rule over education in America. The majority of people use it, and the majority of people submit to the big yellow bus. And so we say, well, what is the meaning of this when you put your child on the bus? Who's influencing them? What is the, what's the, the philosophy that has reigned within the public school system? And we go back in history and find out where all the ideologies came into mm. the public schools that shape the culture of our schools today. Well, you know, Cullen, that big yellow bus is a place, even the bus itself is where indoctrination begins. Not too long ago, uh, in time uh, fragments, uh, it was in Wisconsin where a little six-year-old girl got into a, a big yellow bus and uh, she had been told by her teacher that uh, she could bring any books she wanted to to school and read during free time. And so this little girl, coming from a Christian family, decided, I'm going to bring my little Bible. And so she got onto the big yellow bus, and the driver looked askance at that book and said, what is that? And she said, that's my Bible. And he says, you can't get on here with that. That's against the law. And this little six-year-old began to cry. And she got on with her little Bible and went to school and lo and behold, got off the big yellow bus and went into the classroom and the teacher looked at it again with disdain and said, what is that? And she said, well, you told me I could bring any book that, that uh, to read during free time. And the teacher took that Bible and said, this is garbage and threw it into the garbage, the, the wastebasket. Now, that is not the only place where the big yellow bus influence on kids but here, just this week, being discussed uh, by Mark Belling, one of the anchors in the secular realm of talk shows, is talking about a situation where a bus driver out in New Berlin, uh, it was a parochial school, but the, a child, uh, every time the school bus would come up to this property where the child lived and would pick up the child, there was a sign representing a pro-life candidate on the, on the lawn. And so the teacher, I'm sorry, the bus driver began to challenge the child about that sign being on there. And finally, the child, uh, about 12 years old, said, well, he, the reason they had the sign there was because they believed in pro-life. And the teacher, or, I'm sorry, the bus driver made the statement, uh, I wish you had been aborted. Now, this coming on the big yellow bus, that's before you even get in the classroom, Colin. Oh, that's so sad. And, and I think that the fallacy that a lot of Christians have is that the public schools is somehow neutral. As Christians, we don't believe there's any neutral territory. It's either for Christ or against them. Amen. And it's only now that it's becoming extremely apparent that the public schools is preaching very clearly against Christians. And Christians are the primary victims. You can have Ramadan celebrations and other cultural events within the public schools, but primarily it's Christians that are being persecuted. We outline it in our film where we have a, a valid Victorian giving a speech, and just as she mentions the name of Christ, her microphone is cut by the teacher's. And so you realize, you know, there is a vindictiveness, and that's only in the, it's in the heart of man, the natural rebellion against God and against Christ. But we're seeing it exemplified in the public schools because there's this, uh, this delusion that you can have, have a neutral ground when it comes to education. We're saying there's no neutral ground. That if, if everyone is taught with uh, out regard to the Creator, to glorifying Him, that it's actually a sinful form of education because they're learning practical atheism. They're learning to be humanists because God isn't relevant to them in the classroom. Where, and Christians need to be aware of this, that when they send their kids to these schools, they are influenced not just by that practical atheism, but also by a host of other agendas 
that they would not like, like the homosexual agenda, like the uh, Planned Parenthood organization, and a host of other things that really we want to protect our children from. I want to take a moment and just um, have a copy of your book in my hands, a wonderful book and something that I hope many parents will think about. We will have the opportunity to make it available. It's about 400 pages, 390 pages of vital information with footnotes that uh, are filled in extensive footnotes. And may I say that uh, as we look at the chapter headings, uh, chapter one, America's Trojan Horse, uh, chapter two, Drugging Them Up. Chapter 3, Dumbing Them Down for Discipline uh, discipline Discipleship. And uh, Chapter 5, on, trail for, on Trial for Christ, A Teacher's Testimony. Uh, number 6, A Tale of Two Masters, Parents or the State, uh, which does your school board serve? Number 7, uh, Educational Monopoly. 8, Separation of School and State. Number nine, ed, uh, early American education. Number 10, a firm foundation, a brief survey of the faith of Americans' founding fathers. Uh, number 11, Pavlov's Child. That's Samuel Blumenfeld's uh, special chapter. Chapter 12, the history of, of history textbooks. I'm sure that has to do with uh, the uh, changing of history. Uh, chapter 13, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Doug Phillips. Uh, co-opting of the big education by big business. And, of course, we can go on more. There's 23 chapters in mine. But, folks, this is an encyclopedia dealing with issues and the responses from qualified people. Now, you made this thing into a video as well, correct? Yes, we have a film that's uh, available too, and and, uh, they go very well together. So the book has a lot more detail than the film for those that are are interested in in more of an academic response, but also just to to learn more of the facts. And there's things we just can't get into a film. A film is an hour and a half long, so we can only put so much in it. But the film is is designed to accompany this book. It is very entertaining. And uh, what the story goes that I get in a big yellow school bus and I drive around America. And the people in the book are actually the people that we meet along the way. And we not only have the experts, which you've mentioned, uh, but we also have the eyewitnesses. So we're meeting people all the time, teachers and school principals, that testify to the, 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 the things that we are raising. So it's not purely academic. There's real experience and, and real facts that we bring up in our film that really should open the eyes of those that are still using the public schools. The goal of this film is to really uh, gen- gently and generously talk to those that still use the public school system and we, don't, we know they love their kids, but we want to tell them, look, here's some information that you need to know so that you have an informed choice as you put your child on that yellow bus. Well, and nearly 90% of Christian children are attending public schools. That's right. So the vast majority, which is really kind of an unusual thing in America where there's a, a real still standard for, for liberty and, and uh, freedom, uh, and being able to be self-sufficient, it is really unusual to me that the majority of Christians will depend on the civil magistrate or the government to pay for their child's education. Now, that's one small part of it, but the big issue, of course, is what do they get for it? So we pay all these, <laughs> this money in taxes, and we have a very efficient system. Not only is it anti-Christian, but it's really not a very good system. Um, the, you have in the government system the very, most expensive price in some in some states. It's uh, over twenty-seven thousand dollars per child per per year, which is just unbelievably mm-hmm. expensive. And there's illiteracy in the classroom. They're not you're not getting what you think you're getting. That's right. So, we're warning people, look, you're getting a very low-quality product. Look at the alternatives, and one of the wonderful alternatives that I practice is homeschooling. I have these eight kids, and it's not easy, but what we, we do is we say, well, we're, we can't send them to the public schools, so we, we homeschool them. And homeschooling is now easier than it's ever been before just because of the access to information through the Internet and also the great uh, curriculum that's out there. And so we are encouraging people to consider that opportunity. Well, we're coming up on a break here, folks, but if you're interested in obtaining a copy of this book, it's called Indoctrination, Public Schools and the Decline of Christianity. The book is available. The book is uh, for a donation of $18, the DVD uh, for a donation of $22, but if you'd like to get them both, the set of the book and the DVD, it's $35.
And wel- welcome back to Crosstalk. Uh, folks, if you have school-age kids in your family, you need to get a copy of this book. It will clear up some misconceptions about what's happening in our school systems. And again, after you have kids that are in the public schools, you say, well, they're, they're not having robberies or uh, moral attacks. Uh, maybe you have a good school. I've known of some where they've had to have armed policemen there to protect the kids on the inside to keep them in order. But you know something? Just the godless mentality, the issues of, uh, well, the issues of lifestyle. We're talking about homosexuality being diversity and pressing for diversity training to kids. And of course, we're not talking about hating people, but when you have abnormal, aberrant lifestyles that are being paraded as normality, isn't there some wonder that parents would be upset? Our guest today has written this powerful book, and may I say that as Colin Gunn has put this together, along with, uh, I think it's Joaquin uh, Fernandez. Yes. Uh, the book is called Indoctrination, Public Schools and the Decline of Christianity. Uh, some years back, Colin, here in the Milwaukee school system, there they had a manual, three-ring binders, hard, hard uh, cover binders, complete with about, oh, at least an inch of material that had been put together, and they had hundreds of these binders that were being passed out to the teachers. The binders and the booklets were made by GLSEN, which is the Gay Lesbian uh, Straight Alliance. They were hoping to provide vital information to teachers as to how to infuse the subject of homosexuality in a way that would give more normal handling of it, as they talked about Heather has two mommies uh, or somebody else has two daddies. Now, we're seeing this type of thing along with the weakness of academic excellence. Uh, let's let's go into some of the, the goals of the book. Uh, you, you've got a number of the, the titles we were touching on. Uh, first of all, the Trojan horse concept. How and when did this thing start to invade public education? Well, it really is amazing. You know, conservatives often make the fallacy that things got bad you know, with Obama <laughs> or with the, you know, the, uh, in the 1950s or 60s, that's when things started to get bad. Well, they certainly did take a turn for the, the worse with both of those events, but significantly during the 1800s, there was uh, an infiltration uh, into America by utopianists who had a vision for a different kind of America, not the Christian America that we, it was largely founded on and not a, a, a nation that was founded on the understanding and belief in the Bible. But rather, they, they believed in a, a, a new type of uh, culture, which was uh, utopian. It was uh, perfected, and man was was able to be for, perfected largely through education. So a lot of people, like uh, Robert Owen or Horace Mann or G, and G. Stanley Hall, decided that that was the way to take over America and to fix America was mm-hmm. through the education system. And of course, what it ended up with, and what we have today, is this massive compulsory education system. Uh, which really does indoctrinate. It teaches a whole host of things that you have mentioned. You mentioned the homosexual uh, agenda. Well, we see, we cover that in the film and in the book, where we show that those the Trojan horses are those that uh, they, they, sell, they give you something and it is deceptive and it actually uh, harms you. And uh, parents sending their children to the public schools, they're not aware and they're often not informed of the agenda that's, that's being taught there. And they use a, a method called values clarification. Oh, yes. That, that's when they get the kid and they tell them, hey, you know, well, your mom and dad believe this, but, you know, we don't, we don't think you're a judgmental kind of person and here's uh, two men who want to get married and all these things. And their, their hearts are, are changed. And the saddest thing is their allegiance and their loyalty switches away from their parents as the authority to either the school system uh, but often the school, it's the school system and their peers that dictate the culture and ultimately the beliefs of that child. Colin, I'm going to say this, hopefully, to jar parents who've got kids in public school. I mean, we've just entered another school uh, term here in late August into September. But I would voucher uh, or guess to say that I know that there are scores of parents who have never cracked textbooks that are coming home with the kids or have never gone to a PTA meeting or have never 
even ask to see the curriculum that their kids are studying. Would I be right? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, a lot of parents have uh, abdicated their, their duties. And, and biblically speaking, the, the commission is to the parent to educate. It's, it's us uh, as parents that have, are the ones that have to teach our children the commandments, you know, as you uh, sit at, at home and you walk along the road when you lie down. And that's when we teach people, our children, the commandments of God. And so what we've done is we've entrusted it to others. But there is also a form of deception Parents have become unwittingly uh, trusting towards these systems that are cheating them. So there's a form of self-deception where parents are just saying, well, I'll, I'll just trust the schools and hope for the best. Our film and our book is intended to open their eyes. We feel sorry for them because there's a lot of parents there who hope for the best for their kids and they trust the school and, and they're not getting anything close to what they think they're getting. Colin, I think your book could also be a valuable tool our listeners today would provide a copy of this and the DVD to your pastors. It will put passion into their hearts if they've never seen this material up close. I've had personally the privilege of supervising the operation and the, the building of three Christian schools over the years. And we started, first of all, here in Milwaukee, and our, we had several hundred students by, at the time where we had to merge our school with another fine Christian education because we were also adding radio stations, and we had to decide which direction we're going. But we also had the privilege of helping to set up a school up in Toma and also in Wisconsin Rapids. And uh, have, having seen the struggle, yes, the financial burdens, but there's also a decision that has to be made among parents in order to get your kids into Christian education. And that is, it's called sacrifice. Because in order to do this, and I, I mentioned off the air to you that when we started our kids early in their early uh, education in a Christian school, uh, we counted our pennies. And uh, when it came time to see the wear spots in our carpeting, we had uh, purchased a home that had the old sewn carpeting and it started to look threadbare in some of the joints, and we found out that throw rugs were cheaper than carpeting. And and you, you watched your pennies, but the important thing was that the kids be in Christian education. And when we see what's happening today, could it be that sometimes people are just shrugging their shoulders and say, oh, well, that's just the way things are. But it's people of action who establish Christian schools or who make decisions even regarding what's going on in your public schools. And I would urge you to get a copy of this book and share it. Share it with others. This is powerful material. And the speakers here are are very much... Uh, now, Let My People Go, that's E. Ray Moore. That's, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the judge... Am I correct? Is it no, no, no. That's Roy Moore. And Erie Moore is actually on the for, has been in the forefront of this battle, as, as many of these gentlemen have. Yes. And they are, like Samuel Blumenfeld, they have been around for a long time seeing the things that we say in our book and our film, and they really deserve our attention because these, these guys are the experts. They, they, have not only, they are not only very aware of what's going on in the public schools now, but they have studied it for for 40 years at least and know every aspect of, of the of where we are why we are where we are today so E.A. Moore is a very worthy person to read in Samuel Blumenfeld but we also have John Taylor Gatto in there as well mm. and he was actually awarded Teacher of the Year in New York City and New York State in the same year very unusual that you would have a teacher so qualified to actually start to speak out against the system as he has been doing since his, his exodus from the public school system when you have comments for Erwin Lutzer, personal friend, uh, when a nation forgets God, authoritarianism, and government schools, uh, this touches right on the whole issue because morality is decided in these corridors and uh, you find that kids are subject to being drawn into this and that's, that's what the kids are being taught often like lemmings going into the sea. You find young people. Is it any wonder that some reports are saying that kids, after they graduate from high school or going to college, that many of them are doing what they say is denying or abandoning their faith? Absolutely. So uh, Erwin Lutzer certainly speaks to that well in, in the book and the film, and we, he draws the parallel between Nazi Germany, where you have an authoritarian mm. government that took over 
the whole nation, largely through the youth movement, by uh, co-opting all the youth movements into the Hitler Youth, and therefore indoctrin- <coughs> indoctrinating them into the class of uh, uh, the, uh, this unbelief and this idolatry of the state. And so sadly, that's what we're seeing very much today, that we wonder why, why can't people understand the abortion issue or these other issues that are political. Well, it's because they've been indoctrinated, and we really can't fix any political issue until we it fix the problem of the public school system controlling the future of America by controlling the hearts and minds of all the children that are sent there. And all you need to do, Colin, is lose one generation, and you have congressmen who don't have standards, you have pastors who don't have standards, you have governors and politicians and city authority that have lost their compass, their moral compass, and you've got a mess, and I think we're seeing it played out even today. We're going to open our phone lines, and I know Colin would be glad to answer questions, make comments if you'd like. Uh, We would welcome your calls right now. We're going to open our lines here in the studios for comment. The phone number here is 800-733-9829. 800-733-9829. We'll take your calls as the light up here and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Colin, we've got about a minute or two before we start taking calls. Back to you. Well, we, we are in, in, in encouraging people to be aware of this issue. We, we, a lot of it is used, a lot of educational talk is used as a political football but really what you have, your ultimate concern is for your child. It might not even be your child. It might be your grandchild or your neighbor's mm-hmm. child. Everyone who's in a public school or uses the public schools, they need to have this information at hand because it's vital and it could be vital to the life of their child. We cover a story of Columbine where a man loses his child to a system that teaches evolution that because as a result of the, the culture of the school, he lost his own son. So it's really important you, you hear the testimonies in our film and, and be, be warned. I was talking with Ken Ham about a pastor who was telling his young people, well, he said there are some people that believe in creation six days. Some people believe in the Big Bang Theory. He says that's what I personally hold to. But whatever you'd like, that's fine. And Ken put it this way. He said, if you can't be sure about the miraculous power of God to create as the Bible says it, why should a kid believe anything else that's in that book? Oh, I absolutely. I think the faith of, of many children are undermined very quickly in the science class when they're taught to they're, the, the Bible is literally discredited in front of them mm. rather than it being a, an understanding of, of real science, which is creation science being taught to them. Our telephone lines are jammed in the studio here, so we'll take your calls as uh, we come here and back after the break. Colin Gunn, our guest today, the author, co-author of this fine book. Uh, Colin, you mentioned something during the break, which I thought ought to be reminded again, that we are facing urgency on this. Oh, absolutely. We we, uh, meet it all the time where we have to encourage those. There's a lot of people that want to change the system, and I will say to them often, you know, don't spend the next 12 years fighting the school board and trying to fix the system while your child is suffering with the system that's anti-Christian. There's such an urgency to this that you really need to act now, and we will help you in any way we can. If you email us through our website or, uh, you know, seek help if you are, are concerned about the public school system, there really is an urgency. Our film mm-hmm. makes it very clear with the story of Columbine that you have to really protect your children at any cost, even if it's difficult. You do it now. And, uh, Colin, why don't we give your website several times now for people to write it down because you do have a point of contact and resources available. Absolutely. So So they can get hold of me through indoctrinationmovie.com. So that's www.indoctrinationmovie.com. And if they uh, go to that website, they can find out about hosting a screening or they can get in touch with me if they need uh, any help and, or any advice about homeschooling. We'll do everything we can to help you. Indoctrinationmovie.com. Yes. Okay, that'll work. Right now we've got phones lined up here, lit up all across, and we're going to go to Milston right now on line one and talk to Dan. Dan, you're on the air. Yes, uh, first of all, Colin, Vic, thanks for uh, bringing this up. You know, I used to be a, um, well, I'm a retired teacher, and I would have to echo the um, indoctrination uh, theme that you have today. Um, 
the uh, you know I would take it a step further because indoctrination starts at the university level, mm-hmm. and uh, training new teachers and indoctrinating new teachers and ways to um, uh, you know to to teach in the public school. I, I really think that it has started it had started there back in the '60s and '70s when you know when I was going to college. Um, you know, the, there's an old saying, and, uh, you know, I like old sayings. We don't have them very much anymore, but the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's right. And I think that they've taken that to heart in the, in, um, the education field. Uh, and one other thing, too, I just think that uh, the schools have become so much of a social club rather than a, an entity of education. Um, I'm just going to hang up and listen to you guys, okay? Well, thank you for those comments, Dan, from Milston. Appreciate that. You know, one of the things is kind of interesting, uh, Colin, as we're, we're dealing with even the subject of evolution versus creation, uh, where educators are saying to the kids, now you're, some of your parents may believe in that archaic idea, but we, we don't want you to be trapped in that and that false information because we're living in the world of science and technology and we need you to contribute to the scientific aspect of our world today. So we don't want, don't ruin. And then they say to the parents, you go ahead and believe it if you want to, but don't ruin your kid's life. Boy, this is blatant. Yeah, well, I appreciate Dan. He's, he's one of my favorite kind of teachers, a retired teacher, and one who's willing to be bold on this issue. And we mm. find all across the country when teachers who you think might be a little bit upset with us not liking the public schools, even if they're still working for the system, yes. more often than not they're coming up and saying, yes, Colin, you're exactly correct. In fact, they'll say to me, it's much worse. And so the teacher training issue is a significant part of it. It really is part of what, what control is all about. The, those in the 1800s that established the compulsory school system knew very well and uh, that if you get the child away from the parents, then you've got control of culture. So that is a very apt phrase of the, the hand that rocks the cradle. And so when Marxism came along in the 1800s, the 10th the plank of the Communi- Communist Manifesto was free public education for all. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, America has adopted most of those planks wholeheartedly, especially the education one. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing full control over the future of our culture through the, the minds and hearts of the children that are sent to the public schools. We're going to go to Mike right now on line number two. And Mike, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, Vic. Great yeah. program. Thank you. Um, I'd like I'd like to make a couple comments. I think this whole uh, business of the deterioration of society started when Madeleine O'Hare took the Bible out of the schools. And I think that was our base for moral and ethical uh, society. And, you know, I can remember, Vic, when I went back, when I was in school, we had what was called milk monitors in the hallways. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we have, we have a lockdown with armed guards and cameras in the schools and shootings and drugs and you know, you have to go back a couple generations, and, you know, it, it goes back to that theory of the, the frog and the boiling kettle of water. Mm-hmm. If you have a boiling kettle of water and you throw a frog and it pops out, if you put it in when it's cold and you slowly turn the heat up, you, you cook it to death. And I think society has been cooked to death as far as the slow decay of, of, of morals and ethics in our society. That would be the analogy that I would like to draw. On. And uh, also, I... The churches, you, you try walking into a church at night, wow, 40 years ago I could walk in at any given time and go into a church and then pray to God. Now they're all locked, and it's like you've got to turn around and go, what's happened here? Something's really, really wrong. Well, churches used to have an evening service, but apparently there wasn't enough to attract people to an evening service, so they've most of them are closed. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Cohen, that compared to 40 years ago and even 40 years ago before that. Society has just been oh. t- tossed topsy-turvy. Oh, we're, we're living in a very difficult time. Uh, I think you're, you're right about Madeleine Murray O'Hare being a significant uh, party to that. But what, you, know, you, you have to remember we also gave the game up earlier on in that we, submit, we allowed the state to take control over education and become responsible for it, and that led to a large, to a large extent, the, the majority of Christians abdicating on this issue mm-hmm. and trusting the state. And so, when you have a monopoly, that's where those these strange ethics 
come in. That's when you get people like Madeleine Murray O'Hare jumping in and trying to get control of it. It wouldn't exist in a free market where there was uh, uh, many private schools. So all of the bad things are, are, are to some extent, uh, some extent symptoms of what happened much earlier than the 50s and 60s back to the 1800s where there really was a move to have this large uh, progressive system. And you have to look back. The atheists were there back in the 1800s. Uh, Dewey, who has a lot of respect, has many public schools named after him, was an avowed atheist. Even earlier than that, we have Robert Owen, who was an, also an atheist who established New Harmony in Indiana, but also was the, one of the leading theoreticians, along with, with Horace Mann, the Unitarian, which is an unchristian worldview. All these guys were there early on, so we started to see a, an unfolding of our culture uh, way back then, and we see it manifest throughout our own era uh, in a significant way. You know, Colin also is, and I have met Bill Murray, the the son of Madeline Murray O'Hare, who ultimately became a Christian. And I had the privilege of interviewing him on uh, television just shortly after he had accepted Christ. Uh, but he, uh, I'll never forget that evening, he said uh, that he prayed and asked God to forgive him and asked the public to forgive him for being the instrument that uh, his mother used to take prayer and Bible reading out of the schools. But may I suggest that some of that even earlier became the downfall of America because the Bible had already been taken out of the homes or it became a nice bookmark or something on the bookshelf. But cracking the book was something that uh, was not a reality. We saw significant. We've seen significant changes in our culture, and par- partly it was a. In the 1800s, we had a, a, a lack of trust in the scripture through a belief in evolutionary science and uh, a, a higher criticism that didn't trust scripture, or the authority of scripture, and so we've seen significant significant philosophical changes even from the 1700s with all the Enlightenment That's ideas. Right. And so there's many changes in our culture, but the issue of the public schools is it allows your child to be subject to those philosophies, whether it's the uh, gay rights or the uh, progressives or evolution. If you send your child there, be aware that he's open to all of those views, which you wouldn't be if you kept him home or you put him in a private school. Right now the news is a blare with a man who molested children, uh, and he's going to prison for the rest of his life. That's a physical molestation. But folks, there is mental molestation going on in the public school, and the people are getting by scot-free. And I'm not criticizing many fine Christian teachers who are trying to do their very best as they are employed in the public schools, but the molestation is a philosophy that's being pushed overall that literally is a molestation of the mind, and nobody has a penalty for that. Jim in Waniwak, you're on the air. Um, yes, Colin, thank you. Um... I had the privilege, I went, I was raised in the Chicago school system and back in 66 and 67, and then in 72 I went to school in Glasgow where my mom and dad are from, and I noticed it was pretty darn dangerous in Glasgow, a lot more dangerous in Glasgow than Chicago. My question leads to this, how would homeschool go over there as compared to here? And if all our Christians take their kids out of the public schools, where does the salt, the light that should be there go? for the unsafe kids who are still stuck in the public schools? That's a really good question, Jim. I think we answer it in our, our film and in, in our book as well. We, we believe that the salt and light argument is not apt in this circumstance. We believe that those that are commissioned to teach have to, and be evangelists, have to meet some uh, criteria, and one of those is not being a little child. <laughs> a novice, yeah. It's, and one of the things is the, the irony is we're putting uh, the very least equipped person as an apologist in the very worst environment. In fact, an environment most of us aren't in where the Bible is actually mentioned or, or isn't allowed to be mentioned or the use of scripture or prayer is banned. You know, we're putting our children in that hostile environment. And now we, I commend those that, that want to evangelize within the public schools. Uh, but certainly we're, we're not convinced that our children, sending our children on a crusade uh, putting their lives, literally their lives at risk, but very much their souls uh, uh, at risk, is not, it's not a fruitful, and it hasn't borne fruit. We haven't seen the conversions. In fact, we've seen a lot of people leave the church. If you imagine a missionary, if we had a missionary society that sent uh, missionaries ab- abroad and the majority of them converted 
to the religion of the place where we're sending them to, well, I think we would cease <laughs> that mission because of its failure. And well, that's what we're seeing. We really are mm. seeing a failure. And so um, we certainly we certainly need to uh, uh, understand the salt light. We all have to be salt light wherever we are. But using our children within the public schools, we, we certainly don't see it. We're going to take a break and be back in 60 seconds. This is Crosstalk. Our guest today, Colin Gunn, a co-author of the book, Indoctrination, a powerful book and a companion DVD that can be a powerful tool in preparing parents, strengthening pastors, and giving you good understanding of the issues we face. We'll be right back. And we'll back, welcome back to Crosstalk, where we're talking about uh, the importance of good education, Christian education, in a world where secularism is indoctrinating our kids. Now, let me say this, and I maybe maybe get you mad at me, but I'm going to say this. Don't sit there and blink your eyes like a toad in a hailstorm. <laughs> I mean this sincerely, and I mean it in a friendly way, but folks, you can't just sit here and, and deal with an issue without saying, I've got to do something. If you get kids in the public uh, education framework and say, well, I I don't know how I can afford a Christian education. Well, perhaps then something to reinforce or to correct the doctrinal indiscretions that are occur that are literally destroying people's faith. Kids that are, are walking away from the very doctrines that they're being taught. And folks, there comes a day when Johnny or Susie and the, the moral values that are conveyed as a child become their very own. There's a transition time. And it's one thing when it's academic, but it's another thing when it becomes heartfelt. I mean, as kids, I remember this is way what our family standards were, but we were being raised and taught. And well said, Colin, I have never heard of a, of a vicious mission field where the hazards were the greatest and, and, and bringing little children in to be the missionaries. Uh, this argument does not stand. Right now, we're going to go to T uh, Joyce in Taylor, Wisconsin. Joyce, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello, Joyce. You're on the air. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is similar to the one before regarding salt and light, but as long as I've been waiting, I'd like to still speak. Um, we have three children. We've homeschooled up to eighth grade, and then the oldest is now he's um, a third-year Bible and theology major at a Christian, at a Christian school, college. Mm -hmm. And then our second is in 10th grade high school, and he's in public, the public high school, and he was homeschooled up to 7th grade. And then our youngest now, we're still homeschooling, and she's in 8th grade. And I guess my question is, and I, I totally understand and agree with what you're saying, we're in a small town, maybe 40, 40 to 50 graduating class, and I guess my question is that we struggle with is, if they should be a light to the darkness, and I totally understand what you're saying about salt and light, but high school isn't young children. It would be older. So what do you think about that? Um, Joyce, I appreciate your call, and I, I think my, I would say to you what I would say to, to most people who are still using public schools, and that would still the exhortation um, to take your kids out. Uh, and, and uh, you know, two of the arguments you mentioned, one, salt and light, and we've talked about that, but there's another one which is not in my school. That is a considerable other our argument that we hear in favor of public schools, and it usually starts with it, we're in this school, and it's not about, well, Columbine was one of those great schools, and we know that especially at the older ages, more so even than when a child is young, that's when uh, the agenda really kicks in. That's when they really want to win the hearts. Of course, it's not just about the schools themselves. It's about their peers. You know, what really dictates to the, the, the heart of a child It's not the teachers that he's following. It's the, the peers that are dictating what his values, his thoughts. And the mm -hmm. truth is, and I know this because I went to public schools myself, is you don't tell your parents those things that you learn. Your, your heart has changed and essentially damaged in a significant way as it's introduced to, you know, what is the lowest common denominator in the public schools, which is the very worst friend will teach you all these things. And so I do exhort you to, to, to reconsider. I know homeschooling is difficult and it's challenging. You have done it. Um, but I would, I would encourage those, that, especially as the as issues of sexuality come up, that that's when they most need to, to be protected, because that's one of our jobs, is to protect our child's chastity as well as their, their heart and mm. their beliefs. 
Thank you, Joyce. Appreciate a good question. Have time for just about one or two more. We're going to Rosanna in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Rosanna, you're on the air with our guest, Colin Gunn. Hi. Um, Colin, I have a question. Um, I've been struggling with this for a good year now. I feel every day I send my children straight to hell. They're all five in public school. But how, how does a single mom I'm on one income with five children, kindergartner, to senior, and I'm tortured by this because I want to pull them out. I, I see the impact my kindergartners told me yesterday. Mom, it was on the smart board, so it has to be true. And I see it from kindergarten to senior. How, like, how I want to I want to pull them. But how does somebody do that when I am a single mom with my children and one income, so I have to support them? I, how, how would I do that? Well, Susanna, I think the option, obviously the option of private school isn't going to be easy for you, but we do find those that are in your situation being a single mom and limited means um, pick homeschooling. And homeschooling is probably the easiest option for you. And, of course, I say it's, it's never easy to homeschool. It's a considerable challenge. But, of course, everything we do in our life that is difficult is very is usually worth doing. So, you know, be aware that you, you, you got to seek help as much as you can uh, in terms of support. So if you can get support from a church or the homeschooling community, uh, I know that they, well, that's often the story we hear, that those that are, are single parents are able to do it uh, largely through the support of their own network. But, of course, if you don't do it, the costs are going to be significantly higher. Your desire is the d right desire, the desire to protect your children. And as difficult as it is, to, do, to be a homeschooler, especially if you're single, it's so worth it, and it really could potentially save your child's future, their lives, and they will be grateful for it in the long run. One of the things, may I share this with you, Roseanne, too, is that uh, having been involved with Christian education, there are many homeschool curriculums, such as ABECA. Uh, there are some other uh, programs available that are available now on DVD and other ways that you can use uh, in teaching children that are older. Uh, also, you may have to, because of your work schedule, have to readjust the the education time, uh, even in your family structure. Maybe it's afternoons or early evening where you spend three hours or whatever you would need to hit the basics. But again, our prayers are with you, Rosanna, and you raise a good question. May I just say that I trust and pray that there be many churches that would consider a missionary I mean, we talk about going out and having missionary work to pagans and those who are out there in the foreign field. But in many cases, the mission program within the church ought to also include preparing the children for life, even within their own uh, church family. Uh, Colin, I, I just want to say how grateful we are for your being with us today. Hope many will obtain that book. And the DVD, the phone number here is 800-729-9829. Thank you, Rosanna, for calling. And we have come to the end of our program. Colin, we appreciate so much your being with us today. Oh, absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show. The church in America is going to suffer so terribly. And we laugh now, but they will come after us. They will come after our children. They will close the net around us while we are playing soccer mom and soccer dad, or we are arguing over so many little things and mesmerized by so many trinkets, the net even now is closing around you and your children and your grandchildren, and it does not cause you to fear. You will be isolated from society as has already happened. Anyone who tries to run for office who actually believes the Bible will be considered a lunatic until finally we are silenced. We will be called things that we're not and persecuted, not for being followers of Christ, but for being radical fundamentalists who do not know the true way of Christ, which of course is love and tolerance. You'll go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. They've already come after your children, and for most of you, they got them. You got them through the public schools and indoctrination and the university and indoctrination and then you wonder why your children come out not serving the Lord. It's because you fed them right into the devil's mouth. So little by little the net is closing around and then it's not little by little. Look how fast things are going downhill just in a matter of weeks. A matter of weeks. But at the same time, know this. Persecution is always meant for evil, but God always means it for good. And is it 
not better to suffer in this life to have an extra weight of glory in heaven. You must settle this in your mind. This is the one thing I want to say over and over. Do not believe. Down through history, you have a wrong idea of martyrdom and persecution. You think that these men were persecuted and martyred for their sincere faith in Jesus Christ. That was the real reason, but no one heard that publicly. They were martyred and they were persecuted as enemies of the state, as child molesters, as bigots, as narrow minded, stupid people who had fallen for a ruse and can contribute nothing to society. Your suffering will not be noble. So your mind must be filled with the word of God when all people persecute you and turn on you. And if the spirit of God and common grace pulls back and you see even your children and your grandchildren tossing in the lot that you should die. This is no game. You want revival and awakening, but know this. For the most part, great awakenings have come only preceding great national catastrophes or the persecution of the church. I believe God is bringing a great awakening, but I believe that he is raising up young men who are strong in trust in the providence of God to be able to wade through the hell that's going to break loose on us. And it will be on us before we even recognize it. Unless, unless in God's providence, he is not done. He is not done. Now note, this is, this is not silly talk. Apart from a great awakening, these things are going to come upon you. Be ready to lose your homes, your cars, and everything.